Good morning, everyone, and welcome. This webinar is brought to you by Strategies 2.0, a statewide collaborative funded by the California Office of Child Abuse Prevention. Today's webinar is Creating Trauma-Informed Early Childhood Learning Environments 101. The webinar is scheduled from 10 until 11.30 a.m. My name is Carrie Collins, and I am your facilitator for today. So my role is to introduce the topic and the presenter, keep track of time, and help the presenters and participants in any way that I can. In a moment, I will introduce the presenters to you, but first I would like to go over a few of the webinar guidelines. So all of you should have a toolbar that uh, is on your screen. Just know that we cannot see that. You're the only ones that can see that. You can control your tool toolbar by clicking on this little red arrow here, and then it will uh, minimize it. You are either on your telephone or on your microphone uh, and speakers on your computer. Uh, so either way of the either one of those is okay. Just whichever one you prefer. I have muted everyone, so you don't need to worry that we're going to hear any outside noise. We're going to utilize the chat box today in a couple of ways. Um, this is the place for you to put any questions that you might have during the process of this webinar, and our presenters will address all questions at the end of the webinar. However, there will be a couple of times during the webinar that they may ask you to type something into the chat box. So just to make sure that it's working okay, for those of you who would like to, go ahead and type in um, where you're from, maybe your agency and your job title so we can get a feel of who is in the room with us today. So we have an AspiroNet director, oh, Florida. Wow, child development professor, learning coalition. Wow, this goes really, really fast, but I see we have a lot of people on the line today with a huge variety. We have some infant toddler teachers, people from Head Start programs, child development consultants. I saw a public health nurse. We have somebody from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Welcome, Pennsylvania. I wish I could see them all, but this goes very, very fast. Thank you so much for participating in this. It lets me know, first of all, that you can hear me, and then it gives us a little bit of an idea of who is in the room with us today. So we have a huge variety of um, different job titles, different agencies, and from all around the United States joining us today. That is great. So my colleague Alma Tovar will monitor the chat box, and she's going to be the one that will pass on the questions to our presenters today. Um, we're not going to use the raise your hand function today. Um, We'll just we'll, we'll mostly just use the chat box. Like I said before, I have muted all of you, so you do not need to worry about us hearing any of your background noise. So with that said, it's my pleasure to welcome our presenters for today, Lori Chelius and Reagan Overholt. Lori and Reagan will present this webinar today in partnership with Lead for Tomorrow, Family Hui, and ACES Connection Network. Lori Chelius is a partner with Origins Training and Consulting, a firm focused on helping leaders transform their organizations and communities through the science of adversity and resilience. She has spent over 15 years in the healthcare industry with experience in strategic planning, project management, market research, and needs assessment. Reagan Overholt is an analyst at the California Department of Social Services, Children and Family Services Division. Reagan has been in human service work in both the private and public sector for 25 years in the areas of women's health, early child care and education, as well as the foster care system. She sits on several boards and commissions that serve her local county and regional area. I feel very, very honored to welcome Lori and Reagan as our presenters today. And at this time, I'm going to turn over the presenter mode to them.
Great. Thanks, Carrie, so much. And good morning to everyone. And I guess good morning, to, uh, good afternoon to the people we have on the East Coast. That was really exciting to hear that we're pulling from both uh, a range of agencies and organizations, but also some geographies. So thanks for joining today. Very happy to have you all on. <clears throat> So as Carrie mentioned, we're going to be talking about creating trauma-informed early childhood learning environments today. And just to give a broad preview, we will be talking in a moment uh, more specifically about learning objectives. But just to give a broad preview of where we're going with today's conversation, the first, roughly the first half, I'm going to be talking about some general princi principles of trauma-informed and resilience building practices and then hand it over to Reagan, who's gonna be talking about translating those principles into early childhood learning environments. So not sure if this image resonates with anyone on the call today, but one of the perspectives we wanted to bring to this conversation is that we talk about integrating trauma-informed practices. We obviously need to be talking about the students and obviously that's a very important role, but we also wanna be talking about the teachers and all the other staffs working in all types of organizations designed to support kids. Um, so we can't guarantee that this is where you will get at the end of today's call, but we hope that you can walk away with some information and some practical tools that regardless of whether you work for a school, a childcare facility, or an organization that works and supports kids in some other way, but hopefully a little more like this and a little bit less like the frazzled owl on the, the previous slide. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about learning objectives. So we're gonna to talk today about adverse childhood experiences, um, otherwise is known as ACEs, and the effect of different types of stress on the brain and body. We're gonna be talking about the role of resilience and how protective factors can help heal the impact of trauma. We're also gonna be talking about um, exclusionary discipline policies, both what they are and what their effects are, then offer some strategies on how to create resilience building trauma-informed early learning environment environments, and also provide some practical um, tools to, to get started in this work. So what does this all really mean? Um, I mentioned before, we're going to talk more about ACEs and we're going to talk in a fair amount of detail about, uh, about what they are, but um, it, they are about childhood adversity and childhood trauma. And this quote from Trauma Dad, he's, a, he's an advocate and he's a filmmaker and he talks a lot about his own history of childhood trauma that has impacts his experience as a parent of two young children. So a lot of what we're talking about today speaks to empathizing with and understanding the kids we're working with and also how our own experiences impacts the work we do and really summarize that this and by this quote and that last sentence in the quote we can change their aces by acknowledging ours and breaking the cycle so that's a big part of the perspective we're bringing to today's conversation So before diving into the content of today's session, we just want to acknowledge the really important role that early childhood um, educators play. I have three young kids myself, and I, um, the youngest just got out of preschool, and I am just amazed by the skill and the patient and the, and the care and the, and the love that um, early educators bring to this work. So uh, just as a sort of thank you and acknowledgement of that role up front. And, Many of you know, chose the work you do because you know the incredibly important role that those early years have in establishing a foundation on a child's developing brain. But just a couple facts to, to, to bring some background information on that is more than one million new neural connections are created every second. And again, what's really happening in those first few years, it lays the groundwork and the foundation for all of that child's future learning behavior and health. And you can see here in this image, the very striking difference between the brain of a child who has not suffered trauma on the left and one that has been exposed to extreme neglect on the right. So again, this is pretty striking. And one of the things we wanna talk about today is how, early, how important those early relationships are um, in those early experiences. Obviously the role of the parent is critical 
the parents is critical, but other relationships, caregivers, teachers also form incredibly important relations that have a deep impact and imprint on those, on those, that early developing brain. So then all that being said, just thank you for all the role you're playing and all the work you're doing. So in this next section, what we're going to talk about ACEs. Some of you may have heard about ACEs. Some of you may have heard the term. Some of you may be very familiar with it. Some of you, this might be the first time you're hearing about it. So what we're hoping to do here is just provide a foundation and a common language and framework to provide some background information on this. So first, what are ACEs? ACEs are adverse childhood experiences. And this term comes from a study that was published in 1998 that we're gonna be talking about in more detail today, today. The other term we wanna introduce here is toxic stress. We'll often hear those terms together. You can think of an adverse childhood experience as one that often leads to toxic stress. And we're gonna be coming back to the topic of toxic stress in a little bit later in the presentation. So the original ACE study, as I mentioned, it was published in 1998. The two pictures here are the two original investigators, lead investigators of the studies, Dr. Vincent Folletti on the left from Kaiser Permanente and Dr. Rob Anda on the right from the Centers for Disease Control. So again, it was a co collaboration between Kaiser and the CDC. And what they looked at is the adult health outcomes and behaviors and track that against the a number of experiences people had ex uh, those adults had experienced in their um, in their childhood so we looked at the relationship between those early childhood experiences and a variety of health behaviors and outcomes so as we look at the demographics one thing we just wanted to point out here is we look at the demographics of who was studied it was studied with over 17,000 in this original a study it was a mostly white mostly college educated and mostly middle class sample. So this next graph summarizes the 10 ACEs that were measured in this study. And as you can see, each of the 10 measures falls into one of three categories, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. So each participant in the study received a score of between zero and 10, one point for each ACE they experienced before the age of 18. And what, what I think if we, if we look at this list, we can probably all agree that these are indeed significant sources of childhood adversity. But one of the points we wanted to make is that there's other sources of adversity that um, kids and, um, and youth experience. And we just wanted to highlight a couple of examples. This is certainly not a, an exhaustive list of other types of adversity that wasn't captured in this original ACE framework. Um, food insecurity, community violence, racism, bullying, uh, living ex in foster care, et cetera. So we just talked about what ACEs are. What did the ACE study find? First of all, ACEs are incredibly common. Almost two thirds of the participant in the study reported having at least one ACE. ACEs also tend to occur together. If you have one ACE, there's an 87% 87 chance you have two or more ACEs and a 50% chance of three or more ACEs. Women are also 50% more likely than men to have a score greater than five. And if we look more specifically at the pre prevalence of specific ACEs, Physical abuse and household substance abuse were the most commonly reported ACE in this study. So if we look at this data, it's really hard not to reach the conclusion that we all are affected by ACEs in some way. ACEs impact all of us, whether it's directly through our own personal experiences or indirectly through um, our friends, our families, our community, uh, community members. So as articulated here by Dr. Rob Anda, this really isn't a them problem, this is an us problem. This affects our communities, our schools, and our workplaces. So we know ACEs are common, but what's the impact of ACEs? Put in the most simple way, as your ACE score goes up, so does your risk factor on a number of health and behavior outcomes. 
And these outcomes range, it can include a range of physical health, mental health, and behavioral outcomes, ranging from substance abuse, cancer, heart disease, and miswork. One piece of data that's always struck me is that if you have four or more ACEs, your risk of cancer is doubled. So if you think about it for that for a moment, it's a pretty striking statistic. So let's look at a couple more specific data points. You can see a number of things here, but I just wanted to highlight IV drug use and suicide attempts. Um, if you look at those without any ACEs who report not having any, any ACEs, one in 408, 480 report using IV drugs. That goes all the way up to one in 30 among those with seven or more ACEs. If you look at a suicide attempts, one in 96 among those who report having zero ACEs, and that jumps all the way up to one in five among people with who report having seven or more ACEs. Whenever Dr. Politi talks about his work, he really emphasizes a fundamental reframe of the way we think about the link between trauma, childhood trauma and health outcomes. And maybe the, one of the best ways to describe this actually comes from how the A study, a study actually came to be. So Felitti was actually conducting a study with obesity patients and observed a finding that many of his patients who were having success in his program losing weight were sometimes dropping out or disengaging in some way. And so he interviewed them, became curious and, and, and interviewed them and sort of stumbled upon the fact that a surprising number of them had actually experienced childhood sexual abuse. And so when he dug a little bit deeper, what he found out was that losing weight was actually a trigger for them because it brought on unwanted sexual attention. So for some of the patients, obesity was actually providing a solution. So if we use that reframe, it gives us a, a different perspective really to think through many of our traditional approaches to public health and behavior. So we often tell people to simply stop engaging in a behavior that is disruptive or is associated with poor outcomes. Just an example of that would be smoking. We often people tell people just to stop smoking or we emphasizing, emphasize providing educational materials on the negative health consequences of smoking. But if we think about that reframe and if smoking perhaps provides a solution to some people, how effective would simply telling people to stop smoking be? So the pyramid on the left comes from the original ACE study and looks at the role of ACEs, um, adverse childhood experiences at the bottom, leading all the way up to early, the early death um, at the top of the pyramid. So that relationship, so the ACEs leading to the social, emotional, and cognitive impairments, then in turn leading to the adoption of health risk behaviors, then in turn leading to increased risk and disease, disability, and then perhaps early de death. The pyramid on the right, which is was adapted by the Rise Youth Center in Oakland, sorry, in Richmond, expands that view to really integrate below that level below ACEs to include the role of structural racism and historical trauma and how they also play a role in this relationship between childhood adversity and early death. This framework was put together by Wendy Ellis and her group and also takes an, a more expanded view of ACEs to include both the adverse childhood experiences, we talked about those 10 things at the, the top of the tree, and adverse community environments, those are the roots there that you can see, including poverty, discrimination, poor housing, community violence. So as we step back and think about all this information, really it supports this paradigm shift to really change the way we're thinking from what's wrong with you to what's happened to you. So we just went through a, a sort of a brief overview of ACEs and the relationship between childhood adversity and health outcomes and behavior. But in the next section, what we wanna talk a little bit more about or talk about is what's happening in our brains and the rest of our bodies when we're experiencing adversity and stress. So let's first take a, a, a look at the different types of stress, positive, tolerable, and toxic. This framework was put together by the Center on the Developing Child 
So positive stress, I think a, a question might be, how is it possible that stress is positive? Everyone's telling me to reduce stress in my life. How is it possible? Well, positive stress can actually be quite motivating. It can get us out of the bed in the morning. It can help us prepare for a test, maybe meet a, meet a work guideline. Um, we might feel some butterflies or a little bit of increase in the heart rate, but it's short-lived and it's, it's really appropriate to the situation at hand. And again, it can be really in some ways motivating to get, to, to get things done. Let me go back here. If we look at tolerable stress, this is a more intense stress reaction. Um, um, more, um, our heights might be racing, our bodies might be sweating. But the important part here is that we have the capacity to deal with it. We can still connect with others, and we recruit, and we have the capacity to to in the relationships and the tools to really create a buffer from that tolerable stress, leading to the next category of stress, which is toxic. So again, it can be in intense, but it's short-lived and we can have the ability to deal with it. We have the capacity to deal with it. So toxic stress is when we experience an intense stress and our bodies just don't have the capacity to, to handle it. It can happen over a period of time or in shorter but more frequent episodes. And our bodies and brains in this situation really go into to overdrive. This is a danger zone and if it stays on for a long period of time, this is when we can start to see some of the negative outcomes. Uh, Nadine Burke Harris, Harris, who many of you may have, some of you may have heard of, but she's a pediatrician who really has done a lot of work in this space and has really led a national movement to um, routinely screen children for adverse childhood experiences as part of pediatrician screenings. Um, she uses the analogy of a bear. And if kids are exposed to enough traumatic events, that is enough bears, their bodies begin to respond to the danger of a bear with a physiological response that can continue even when the bear is no longer there. So what's actually happening in the brain when we're experiencing this toxic stress? Dan Siegel, a neuroscientist at UCLA, uses this image to explain what happens. So imagine that your arm is the brain stem. Um, you fold over your thumb. So your thumb is going to represent the amygdala which is the fear center, it's the alarm center in your brain. And then your fingers, which will go over your thumb, are your thinking brain. So if you've ever heard the term, I flip my lid, it can be used to describe the times when we really lost the ability to think clearly, be calm, or make intentional choices. When those fingers are up, when that lid is, fit, lid is flipped, the amygdala is in charge. And again, that's your fear center. So you've got three standard uh, responses fight, flight, or freeze. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more next. But just think about a time. This, this is a tool you can use for your kids um, to talk about where they are and how they're feeling. You can also use it for yourself to talk about how you're feeling and when your flip, lid is flipped. I think we've all been there when we're so angry, scared, or anxious that we just can't find the words and our thinking brain is simply not in charge. So that's what happens in a sort of very brief way of um, in your brain. So how does that relate relate to your to the rest of your body? So in the hand model we just described, um, your arm was the brain stem and the brain stem actually extends into the body's nervous system, specifically the autonomic nervous system. And the idea we want to talk about in the next concept we want to introduce is a window of tolerance. Um, and to really describe how our bodies are experiencing the stress we've talked about. You can think of the window of tolerance of, of sort of like a, a comfort zone for your body's nervous system. So when we're outside of that comfort zone, we might move into a hyper arousal that's above the line, fight or flight, or a hypo a below that line, free state. People who have experienced high ACEs often have a very small window of tolerance and something seemingly inconsequential can result in the, that person flipping their lid. So think back to the analogy of the bear that Navy Burke Harris talks about. Sometimes it's not that the bear that's going to um, send us, the bear might send us outside of our um, window of tolerance, but it might be something else um, that might appear on the surface to be, to be inconsequential, but is triggered you or a child to be outside of that window of tolerance. So if our goal is to help students learn and to work cooperatively with, with our peers and our colleagues, we also need to, to stay within our window of tolerance. So what we're talking about here is both an understanding of the kids and their experience, but also our own reactions and how that, how that really interplays with, with the learning environment. 
So let's just talk really briefly about what happens in each of these states. In this hypoarousal state, again, that fight or flight state, we have increases in heart rates, blood pressure and adrenaline, and decreases in digestion and an immune response. So the overactivation of the system might explain some of the negative health outcomes we talked before about when we talked about the ACEs and some of the other related research. So one of the things to highlight here is that there's practitioners and neuroscientists highlight that many of the symptoms associated with being in this hypoarousal state are sometimes actually misdiagnosed and look very similar to attention deficit disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, oppositional defiance disorder, and conduct disorder. And then in the freeze response, so that hypoarousal state, the body is adapting to stress in a way that's similar to feigning death. So maybe people who've experienced uh, trauma report having, using this freeze response to actually keep them safe in times of high stress. And one of the things to note here is sometimes those responses are missed because they might look very much more like compliance on the surface. Sometimes a traumatized child is not acting out, but is actually very quiet and more hesitant to explore the world and more compliant. So we talked just a little bit about the stress system, but we just want to come back to some of the causes of the stress we experience, which um, is pain. And we've all heard the, stone, the phrase, sticks and stones may break our, my bones, but names will never hurt me. And I think, I think hopefully that's been dispelled as a myth because the reality is that emotional and physical pain are processed in very similar places in the body and the brain. And so while physical trauma is, is indeed significant, emotional and um, pain can also be a significant source of trauma. And we often talk about the experience of trauma as a disconnection in terms of relationship and how in that, that break in re, um, relationship and the importance of repairing those relationships. So we've talked about um, hold on. babies this young. Pause us just to introduce us. Um, this video, of, um, I'm not sure if any of you have seen it, but it brings to life, I think, some of the stress responses we're talking about in a young child. Just a warning, I've seen this video a million times and it is, it is sort of hard to watch if you haven't seen it before. Um, but to, so just to warn you, but it really, it, the attempt here is to bring to life some of the concepts we're talking about in stress and how the, a young child experiences that stress. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying 34 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I need my Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world, and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions. They turn away. They feel the stress of it. They actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. It's a little like the good 
the bad and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. So we're going to be talking next about the role of resilience, but just to me, one of the biggest takeaways we, from that video is this is the importance of relationships. We've talked a lot about this today and how those relationships and those human dynamics and connections can be so, can be potentially a source of harm if they don't exist in a strong way, but also such a, such a source of healing um, when they are repaired and um, in terms of overcoming that stress that they've experienced. So let's talk about resilience a little bit more. So what is resilience? We've talked, uh, we've talked a little bit about that. It's a, it's a little bit of a buzzword these days, but what do we actually mean by it? And we talked earlier about the different types of stress, positive, tolerable, and toxic stress. And toxic stress is, is the stress that really overwhelms our systems. And tolerable stress can be intense, but we also have the capacity to deal with it. We have the systems we need to buffer those effects so we're not overwhelmed. And the Center for the Developing Child offers that resilience are those things that have the ability to term, transform toxic stress into tolerable stress. And we wanna try resilient, tie resilience to the brain and body information we just talked about and talked about how resilience can be served and sustained. So we know that trauma and toxic stress can make deep imprints on our body and brain. So if that's the case, then building resilience must include changes in the body, brain, body and brain too. So these changes are possible throughout all, across the lifespan at any age, but they're much, much easier in that early developing brain that we've been talking about. So that change, again, while possible, just becomes more, more challenging um, as we get older. So Cheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook, and she's the co-author of Option B, a book she wrote about resilience after the death of her husband. She talks about resilience as a muscle that you can build. So we wanted to spend a little bit talk, talk, time talking about or what are some of those protective factors that can help build that muscle. So this question has been um, studied quite a bit and the Center for the Developing Child has pulled out these, these universally or evidence-based um, factors in children that really support the build, building of resilience, the presence of at least one stable, caring adult. We've talked a lot about the importance of those relationships today, those early relationships. And this, this keeps coming back in study after study of how important the, that one, at least that one stable, caring adult can be. And again, just to point out, that could be a parent, but it could also be a, a teacher or other, some other type of, of caregiver a belief in the ability to overcome hardship, hardship, the development of a strong executive functioning and self-regulation. So again, we talked about before with stress, sometimes stress can actually, positive stress at least, can play a role in helping us learn to regulate our systems. And we have those opportunities to, to learn to do that. And then the support of faith and cultural conditions. So we talked earlier about the reframe of going from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. And we want to take that one step further as so we talk about the role of resilience and really encourage another reframe. Um, this time going from what's wrong with you to actually what's right with you. So what are those strengths? What are those protective factors that have the ability to, to transform toxic stress into to tolerable stress? So we've talked a lot about things at an individual level, and what we want to do for a moment is just to translate some of that to what does this look like at an organizational level, and what's a relationship between, between individual capacity and organizational resilience? So Sandra Bloom, um, she's the creator of the Sanctuary Model. She, she has one of the models of trauma-informed practices that has been used in the medical field. She talks about organizations as living systems, 
Um, she's a psychiatrist by training. She came to this model after observing that many of the organizations and systems that were designed to serve patients with mental health issues were in fact, in many cases, actually re-traumatizing them. So the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services in Administration, known as SAMHSA, a federal agency, they've outlined six principles that serve as an approach for building a trauma-informed organization. So safety, trustworthiness, trans and transparency, uh, peer support, collaboration, neutrality, empowerment, voice, and choice, and then a recognition of cultural, historical, and gender issues. And as part of the, their um, principles, they really make a distinction between the trauma-informed approach for an organization, so these principles, versus those trauma-specific therapeutic intervention, interventions designed to directly heal the impact of trauma. So this approach, so a trauma-informed organization is really one that recognizes and acknowledges the impact of trauma on, on clients, on their families, on their staff, and then responds by taking that awareness and integrating it into policies and procedures and practices throughout the organization. Ken Epstein um, here on the right, he, he's led a trauma-informed approach at, at San Francisco Department of Health, and he talks about healing principles. You can see here reflection, collaboration, creating a culture of learning, growth and prevention, um, relational leadership. So before we transition to the next section, um, where we're going to talk, Reagan's going to talk more specifically about some of what some of this looks like in an early childhood learning environment. We just wanted to take a moment and to ask all of you to think about and reflect and, and share if you're, if you're willing to what and ask what resilience would look like in the organization, whether your organization is a school, whether it's a child care facility site or an organization that, that supports kids or an agency. So if you could take a moment just to think about what, what a resilient organization would look like to you. Again, that could be something that your organization is already doing, or it could be something that you aspire to do. And just in the chat box, maybe write one or two words to just share. Um, and I think Alma will share with a larger group um, some, of those, some of those words that, that pop into your mind as you think about resilient organizations. Being supportive when mistakes are made. I don't see any more. <laughs> okay, there's another one here. Yes, everyone will. Um, no, that's not a comment. Show grace, peer support from our clients, working as a team especially when they come into our office, oh, they're going too fast. Resilient staff support each other. Great. Reflect their practices. Validation of parents' feelings, recognition and encouragement. Supporting our families. Strength-based interventions. Accepting. Keeping healthy ourselves. Great, yeah. Great, those are some great ideas. I heard teamwork, mm -hmm. self care, empathy, collaboration. Um, I think I heard something along the lines of integrity, and those are great ideas. Thank you. So, we want to talk a little bit about trauma um, and young children. And here are some basic facts. And I think that um, what we sometimes and sometimes don't recognize is that um, that these traumatized children are in our in our programs, in our schools, in our childcare, in um, in the programs that we um, support that have our our families and children as priorities. Um, so that's something to consider. I mean, one of our, out of every four, and it potentially could be a higher number. But we want, um, we want people to recognize that this could be a reason for um, how they perform in school and their ability to learn, that they have physical and emotional distress as a result of their trauma. But again, you can help a young child who's been traumatized. We talk about the, the strong, supportive, stable relationship, and we talked about recognizing some of these symptoms, not as a child who um, is out of control, but a child who's had some Pretty significant um, early experiences. 
Traumatized children are in your programs. They often just happen once, perhaps it's a divorce or perhaps it's a, a major move or there's a death in the family. Others are continuous like food insecurity or homelessness. And those who experience multiple traumas, um, th that part of that toxic stress, that ongoing, um, it, those ongoing issues that cause those children to really not be able to respond in a typical manner will have um, a, a, an impact on your programs. They'll have, um, a ch you'll be challenged because their little brains are often overwhelmed and they're always in survival mode. They're not in learning mode. Again, a, not an um, exclusive list of situations that can be tra traumatic, but obvious things that um, happen in families, neglect and abandonment, emotional, verbal, sexual abuse, Death of a loved one, you know, a lot of times pets is the first experience children will have, and you don't always acknowledge that as, as traumatic. Witnessing domestic violence, living in chaotic environments, a lot of times that is um, generational. Witnessing or experiencing community violence, those who are in neighborhoods that are always at high risk. An incarcerated relative, inconsistent housing and financial stability, families that are unsure of um, how they're going to continue with um, their uh, a stable situ stable situation um, in in living situation um, that's a that's a easily passed on to their children food insecurity and life threatening illness in a caregiver sometimes children will um, will reveal some of this sometimes parents and families will reveal this but clearly things that you may want to make note of when dealing with your young children please be sure to understand often just validating this, that it's traumatic, that it's difficult is all that a family or a child may need to help with that stressful situation and, and, and offer whatever kind of support can be made available to them. And sometimes it's gonna take a little bit more work to figure out how to best serve them. So here, um, clearly you can see in a study that was done, <coughs> excuse me, in an ACES program is that um, the, the children, um, they, they're showing both the children and the parents, um, their ACEs, their numbers, and those parents who have obviously have a higher ACE score, their children have a higher ACE score. Um, of course, some of this we, like we talked about is a family-based situation, and other times it's generational. And so we just want you to recognize that those families who are very high need or who, in, who are at risk, um, includes their children being at risk and vice versa. And here you can see that the um, impact in the elementary, in the early grades, that ACEs does have a, an impact over that span, over the elementary span. We know that um, literacy and numeracy are important early concepts that need to be established in early education. So when they're not, you start to have this impact over um, these other. Um, problems at, that, that can occur. If there, we know that also studies show that if a child's not reading by grade level at third grade, they're more likely to drop out or fail to complete high school. So these first few years really are impactful and um, do not just, we talked about the, you know, some of the physical health outcomes, but also some of the um, educational outcomes. The, um, and you know, here where they're talking about three or four ACEs, you know, really, those aren't that atypical. Um, we just want, want people to recognize it may not seem like these children have had um, an, early, an early traumatic start or a rough start, but really they have, and um, it can be very impactful. So what does trauma look like? I think um, if you reference back, we talked about um, it can look really obvious. I think this is a great quote from one of the Head Start teachers. And we know their, their head and bodies are out of control. They're on fire. They don't really know sometimes that, that, there's a, that, that their feelings and their behavior and their experiences are all linked. They just know that they can't regulate because their little brains are just, just wired. And, um, and we want to be sure to help start to bridge that gap between how they behave with some self-regulation skills. And here's the hypoarousal. We talked about that window of tolerance, which we'll go back to. 
Sometimes it's really not obvious. They are, these children can be completely shut down and they will very much not um, expose themselves and they'll be very compliant. And although we think, oh, that's a wonderful child, that's a really um, a child who really follows the rules, sometimes it's because they're completely emotionally shut down. They're in that freeze, um, freeze mode. So again, we'll go back to that window of tolerance, that hyperarousal and hypoarousal. And of course, that window of tolerance is where we want um, to help our children get to and help them figure out ways to come down and come up from those arousal zones. As, as Lori mentioned, a lot of times, um, the one thing that, that I consistently heard from um, early educators and care providers is those challenging behaviors of the children, those challenging behaviors. And often it was the acting out, it was the hyperarousal kind of behaviors. It was the ADD, it was the, um, the acting out, the, the behaviors that were very noticeable and people wanted to really quickly identify those kids as troublemakers. And really the reality is they didn't have the ability to self-regulate and that was just how their bodies and minds were working. So when we talk about looking at it through a new perspective, we're not asking you to, um, to take on a new, a new um, activity or a new way of teaching, but simply to look at it through those, that lens of not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. And a lot of times it'll be very clear that that, that, that child that, that you're having challenges with really isn't acting out for any reason other than they just don't have the ability to self-regulate given their early years. So how you respond matters. We, Lori and I were talking before the presentation about you, you get flipped, your children get flipped, you want them to stop screaming, but you're screaming, and so the whole um, lack of regulation is just a, a vicious cycle. That you, If you're not calm and can't calm yourself, they can't calm or calm themselves, and neither one of you is gonna be very happy. So one area that we were asked to talk about is exclusionary discipline and implicit bias and, and how that links back to what we're talking about as far as early, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what we're talking about as far as um, early trauma. So exclusionary discipline is just sort of a fancy word for when you remove a child or exclude a child from a situation as a, as a, as a discipline measure, as a punishment measure. And, um, it's, it's often um, thought of as, you know, they'll, they'll learn they, they've missed out on something, but really removing them takes them away from those enriching environments and the human connections. And you've already broken some of that bond that, that's been established between a provider and the child that's served. And we understand absolutely that these practices are often applied more to children of color, special needs children, and children in poverty because a lot of times their ACEs are higher or their situations are more um, at risk. And so we wanna be clear that it's typical, but it's harmful to young and traumatized children and that it's not recommended to bring, it's recommended to bring these children closer, not push them away. So at circle time, rather than having them sit in the corner because they're acting out, have them come sit next to you. Um, we need to remain in relationship with these children. We need to be sure that they understand that a caring, safe adult um, De behaves in a caring manner. And this, um, for anybody who's worked with young children or is a parent, is those children who need the most love will ask for it in the most unloving of ways. They will recognize that something is better than nothing. They often don't know how to get their needs met or ask for attention or support. And in traumatized households, atypical behavior is often very typical and very acceptable and the only way they get that attention and love. So what do we know about exclusionary discipline? Well, at the very, at these, in these very young years, they're being excelled from preschool at a rate of 3.2 times higher than in the upper grades, which is, a, is, is quite shocking because you think that seems like a, a very extreme measure. And um, we know that in K through 12, it's, it's, it's a, more thoughtful process, but our preschoolers, we hear often that preschoolers get kicked out of one, two, three different programs, um, and that's not unusual. And four-year-olds were expelled at a higher rate. We know that um, the, the, they're coming sort of towards the end of their brain development, so a lot of times 
those good synapses haven't been all put into place because they haven't had that opportunity given their rough start. That boys were expelled at a higher rate. Usually boys are more active and so their behaviors can be more challenging. And um, that um, African-American children attending the state funded pre-kindergartens, which we have in California, were twice as likely to be expelled as Latino and white children and significantly more, five times more than the Asian American children. We do want to understand, again, where do those challenging behaviors originate? We want to identify a plan for these children once we recognize that there's more to it than just what, what meets the eye. Um, many, many programs, many classrooms, many um, private providers use social emotional tools for dealing with communication and difficult behaviors. And the, the scariest thing about all of this is that this type of, um, this type of situation where children are expelled from preschools is that it kills the love of learning and it sets up their school or their care providers as the bad guys. And you start that, that early and it's just going to be a continual battle for these young ones. So the impact, pretty clear here. Um, we, we, it's, we know that these early care expulsions predict later expulsions and suspensions. It becomes a, um, a situation, an ongoing and, and cyclical situation. They're 10 times more likely to drop out of high school, experience academic failure, all of these negative school attitudes. And ultimately, this is where some of those conversations around um, the, the uh, pipeline to prison um, comments get made because these early years set it up so that these children face um, some challenges and they just can face those continuous challenges and ultimately um, can, can end in some serious um, results. So implicit bias, um, important because that it affects our understanding and actions in an unconscious manner. So we're not aware of it necessarily. We don't, it's not intentional on our behalf. An example would be um, somebody was talking about, they recently um, encountered a bunch of young men um, hanging out on a sidewalk, talking and, and doing whatever they were doing. And she realized that she had um, started to walk faster she had grabbed her the bags that she was holding and held them a little bit closer and then decided to cross the street. And so when she thought about that, she thought to herself, wow, that was all done in an unconscious manner because I recognized that I had some sort of bias a bunch, about these bunch of teen boys just hanging out on the, on the road. So you have these ideas that in the back of your mind that because of this situation, this is what's going to happen. So that implicit bias is something that's really difficult sometimes to, to see but we want to be sure that you recognize it. And just a, a, little, um, a little show of, again, who, who are teachers looking more closely at and um, when those challenging behaviors are expected. So it's almost a setup for these young children. So clearly the impact is, is important. Um, we want to know, we know that the discipline looks different and we know that it impacts exclusionary um, practices. And ultimately, one of our favorite um, sayings is when you, know, when you know better, you do better. So the more knowledge you gain, the more understanding you have, the better you can um, set yourself up to be um, a good provider, a good educator, a good support system for these children and uh, young children and families. So some practical tools. Um, it's regulation starts with us. Again, if you are standing on the desk with everything out of control around you and you yourself have flipped your lid, absolutely, we're not gonna have much success. So it needs to come back to you figuring out how you can do some self-regulation as well. This preschool teacher was had a great quote. I lose my mind when they go crazy, and they go crazy when I lose my mind. So again, you sort of feed off the chaos. So we want to offer up some tools for you, some self-care thoughts. Um, really, you can't pour from an empty cup. We all know that um, you have to find um, ways to keep yourself centered, keep your, your focus, and stay filled, because we can't support those when we don't feel supported, because we're, we're empty. 
And I think the little video, I mean, the little um, clip here that talks about fit your own oxygen mask first, there's a reason for that. We have to care for ourselves. Um, it's not a luxury or an option. And you're unable to help others when you're struggling yourself with burnout or feeling overwhelmed by a situation. So again, keep calm, take care of yourself. So lots of people do lots of different things as far as um, what works for them. So it's being mind, it's practicing mindfulness, it's having uh, nutrition that works for you, physical activity, sleep, laughter. Again, it's not an, ex, it, an inclusive list at all. Um, it's whatever works for you, whatever fits your, feel, fits your lifestyle and your time constraints. Some people find Self-care is something they do um, alone. Sometimes it's done with others. It could be active and free-floating, or it could be focused. It's whatever brings you peace and balance. So this is another opportunity that we want to take that what works for you? What works um, to help you feel that your, um, that your bucket is getting filled, that you're, that you're um, able to make sure your needs are met? Can you maybe throw up a few of those ideas and just share those? Through, yeah, through the chat box, that would be great. Yeah, the and, and Alma will just, we'll take a minute or two and Alma can share some ideas and tools that people come up with. Can you guys hear me? I was muted. There was hiking, nature, uh, walk with the dog. Um, yeah, I was talking and I was muted. A massage. Um, talking about it with coworkers who understands, going to the beach, uh, singing, dancing, sleep, music. And a lot of those are free. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Gardening, um, yoga, music, meditate, scrapbooking. Reading a book, shopping at Target. <laughs> My kind of therapy, go to the gym, laughing. Laughing yoga, meditation, taking a walk, painting, just reading that makes me feel relaxed. <laughs> Those are great. Thanks yeah. so for all of you. Thank you share. for your feedback. I love, I love the range of, of, of <laughs> techniques that people um, Offered and I love almost point that many of them are free. So one of the things we hear another big buzzword is mindfulness, and here's um, a definition that um, that's often used is the practice of paying attention and being in the moment um, and just being focused on on what what it is you're doing at that time. And so when we talked about some of those. Um, self-care practices, again, just being in the moment. So whether it's active or passive, so we had everything from working out and running to reading and reflection and working out and yoga, kind of goes the whole gamut, but it's being in the moment, focused um, and, and, and aware just where and what you're doing at that time. Another um, graph that shows, talks a little bit about the impact of mindfulness on health on those with ACEs. So you see um, over 2,000 adults were queried and um, regardless of the number of ACEs, whether it was down to no ACEs or three plus ACEs, all of them were affected positively by, um, in the, regarding their, their health, health conditions by practicing mindfulness. So it's a win-win and again, um, it's whatever works for you, but we know that it is helpful and we know that it is um, empowering to get some control over your health conditions. 
And in another way, this is why the dog is happier. He's just focused in the moment with him and his boy. Whereas is where's the, the, the humans like, oh, and I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about this. That dog, one focus, very happy. And the piece that we've referenced multiple times and we can't emphasize enough is the fact that it's that it's the relationship, being in relationship with others. We need to have it. It's not an option. It's not something we um, we should take for granted. We need to have <coughs> the love and to be loved and to belong and to be part of something. If we don't have it, that's when things fall apart. That's when whether we're in whether we have those aces or beyond, um, we're impacted by not having our tribe and having those around us to support us and to be loved with. So some specific tools for the classroom, and these are just a few, and just sort of a starting point for those who are either who are in classroom programs, but also for those who serve families and children. These are just opportunities to present to see if this would be helpful for them as well. So again, we had a director who was just amazed that doing some guided imagery, you know, the close your eyes, picture this, how are you feeling, move like a tree, whatever it might be, has um, such an impact on these children's behavior, even for that very short amount of time. So thinking about things for kids like mindful movement, reflective breathing, um, specific games to help support their awareness of their feelings and thoughts. Um, we want to be sure that that these things don't have to be complicated, don't have to be very self-involved. Again, it can be, okay, when we come in from recess, we're all going to move like trees. It can simply, simply be, again, feel yourself growing roots into the ground as you sit um, and wait for your turn um, to do whatever. So it's easy. And play is fun and important. Some of these activities and games that we do um, with children, um, young and older, um, do help promote self-regulation. They Things like waiting and following directions and um, losing is a big trigger for a lot of children. It, feel, it feels very, they feel very violated. And so in incorporating these, these concepts into, into games, into fun, it helps develop those skills. So simple. Simon says, uh, follow the leader. Those things where they have to stop and think and process are all helpful. So aim my game, what zone are you in? This is a great um, activity that can be done as a group. Um, it can be done individually or on an on regularly or on, on, on excuse me, or as, as needed basis. This helps children identify when they're starting to dysregulate, when they're starting to flip their lid, and then gives you an opportunity to support or assist them in, in coming back to that window of tolerance. And it helps providers themselves with their own regulation, identifying when their children or the activity is causing um, a lack of focus or control. So in, in, in sometimes um, we've heard um, providers say, ooh, I felt myself kind of going into that yellow zone, had to figure out how to bring myself back or children are in that green zone and they're happy and things are going well and you feel that groove. And then red kind of pops up every once in a while and, and, and hopefully not often, but that's why we wanna make sure when people recognize what does yellow look like either for themselves or for their children or for the classroom or for their program. And then backing it away to let's put some things in place that when we know that's what's happening, that we back it up. And a lot of times this is a tool that, um, that providers will use um, individually with the kids that they work with so that um, they feel like they have some they can identify and start to have some control over what they can do to get regulated again. So for those of you, especially like in Head Start programs, at least our local one, um, CLASS, which is the, um, and I of course forgotten the acronym off the top of my head, but we talk about that's the interaction between the um, educator and the child. It's, it's, it's a really easy way um, this serve and return theory about building the relationship. And it's bringing it back to the child. It's bringing back what it is that they put out there and that you respond to. You give it a name, you take turns. 
The interaction is what's important. You want to be sure that you're recognizing what they're putting out there and that you are focused again and, and offering attention and um, making that um, interaction as rich and as focused as possible. <coughs> and some other ways to build resilience in children. Again, I'm gonna keep coming back to that relationship building because ultimately being that stable, caring adult um, to, to both the children and their family is ultimately um, a resilience builder. We also wanna be sure that we collaborate with our community partners. Families need things, children need, need things. And um, one of their roles as, as a support person to them is to get that for them. Get those uh, resources to them, identify them when the families can't, support them when they need that assistance. <coughs> Whenever possible, engage all of those who are working in these programs or the staff that are involved have them help them understand the impact of trauma on behavior. Create, um, I think somebody mentioned this, a positive learning environment um, through classroom management and teaching methods. Some of you do a great job at setting the tone for your environment and for the, the, the scenario you work in. And um, again, sometimes it's, it's classroom based or it's program based and sometimes it's just what you can do in your agency to um, set that tone. And then again, there's positive behavioral intervention supports, restorative justice, social emotional learning, lots of more sophisticated ways to build resilience that can be next steps for those of you who feel like they're ready for them. <coughs> so we have some additional resources that we wanna put up. One of them is in California, we have um, the ACES Connection Network and it's a great um, resource for educators and just about anyone else who might be interested in this topic to investigate and to look for um, resources, to share, to ask questions, um, and just to read up more about the different, um, the different categories that, uh, or the different, um, I think they're calling communities, excuse me, that are available to um, folks. So like um, there's California communities on ACES, uh, connection. There's So there's specific counties or specific geographic regions that you may be interested in being involved with. There's also one specifically for ACEs in child care for those who are child care providers. Um, again, new ways and, and new information and new studies that might be helpful and um, useful in your day-to-day -day work. I just wanted to add here, just in terms of the geography, the ACES Connection also has communities um, in areas um, all throughout the country, so it's not specific to California. Sorry, we just hi highlighted those here since um, we know a lot of you from California, but I think we have a few that aren't. And, anybody's, and anybody can um, access the program, uh, access the website. So in California, again, just wanted to bring it up a little bit that um, there's been funding from the state coming down from the Department of Social Services that's available to um, most of the counties around training that um, tra uh, or tra trauma-informed training. And um, I would encourage you that those who want to, to um, get some more information to contact your local uh, resource and, res and referral, each county um, that's participating um, will, will have that information available to you. So we just wanted to include a couple of um, other resources on self-regulation as well as trauma. So some of them are activities, some of them are just reading some documents or some other opportunities. And so those will also go out to, to those of you who are um, on the line. Those will go out in the email follow-up. include all these. So we want to thank our partners. We um, have had some great um, collaboration with uh, Lead for Tomorrow, who one of their pro programs is Family Hui, which we encourage you to look at as a um, as a um, opportunity to help families um, establish relationship and support. Aces Connection, of course, that um, puts together that amazing website and offers some support services as uh, TA and um, assistance. And then, of course, locally in Yolo County, our um, our local work around um, ACEs and uh, building um, a trauma-informed community.
And with that, I think we are open to questions. If you're able to send them into the chat box, and um, um, and I wasn't sure, Carrie, if you wanted to say anything about the follow up. Um, yes. First of all, I want to thank uh, both of you, Laurie and Raven, for an absolutely excellent presentation. I've been seeing some comments that uh, came along. Um, Alma's wanting to know, can we use the hand raise? I, I suppose that we could use the hand raise if somebody wanted to raise their hand and ask a question. Alma could unmute you, and then you could ask the question directly to the presenter. So that is a function that we have um, for asking questions. Uh, several of you have asked about the presentation. And yes, uh, Alma will be sending out a follow-up email to everyone that will have uh, the resources that were listed in the last couple of slides. It will have a link to the Prezi uh, presentation so that you can watch it again. Um, this, this is also being recorded and it will be uploaded into the strategies ca.org website. So if you wanted to go back and listen to it again, you can also do that. So there's there's several ways that you can do that. I see one question. I'm going to turn this over to Alma. Let me let me read that. And then there's a hand raise, which is a different uh, person. So let me go into the chat. It says we recently experienced regional wildfires in Sonoma County with various levels of stressful experiences for our um, community members. Could you speak about this sort of trauma and how this incident can have lasting effects that can make it um, operate as ongoing trauma? It can be an ongoing thing. Um, let me see. I can unmute uh, the person that asked the question if that's OK. Let me see. OK, one moment. And, and that right, would so be uh, Michael. Michael, I'm going to unmute you. OK, go ahead, Michael. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, OK, perfect. I've never used the microphone on this thing. But uh, yeah, we're uh, Via Esperanza. We're a family resource center here in uh, Santa Rosa in Sonoma County. We're a community action partnership uh, program. And yeah, we, um, we're, we're kind of removed from where the wildfires were at, but we are seeing a lot of families who were either displaced or having financial hardship because of the uh, effects of uh, lost uh, employment. We do have a, a, a pretty sizable wine industry up here. So there's a lot of people who worked in the wineries, construction up in those areas. So it's, it's been, a wide array of uh, types of trauma, everything from, you know, seeing the fires from afar and not knowing what's going on. And we have had a lot of low income families who were evacuate, evacuating without the need to evacuate. And, and in a lot of those cases, they didn't know what was going on. And I'm sure that transferred down to the children that in the uncertainty and just seeing, you know, the, 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 the hills in the glowing red um, in the middle of the night. So. I I yeah, just different things like that. Everybody had a different experience, but I'm sure that for those of us who have stayed and are looking to rebuild, there's always going to be that kind of recurring trauma caused by the different things. Everything from maybe you smell the smoke at a barbecue and at a park, and it reminds you of how much smoke and ash there was in the air, to maybe something more uh, dramatic where you were you actually lost your home. And I was just hoping you could speak on one how you know the ongoing trauma that causes and, and really how we as providers can hope to see that you know see the signs of that and be able to uh, assist their clients sure no it's uh, i think you're you're spot on about just the profound impacts of the type of experiences that trickle really through all levels of the, the community it's interesting i was actually at a conference a couple of weeks ago on um specifically on ACEs and climate change, which is one of those topics that's, I think, getting a lot of traction right now. So as, as climate change is happening and, and um, we're experiencing more of these type of traumatic events, how do we sort of build 
resilience in our community as, as a way to um, keep us connected and not sort of send us into sort of our own individual sort of protective silos. Um, and one of the speakers actually at the conference was um, from Sonoma um, and talked about their own recent experiences. I think when they, you know, were originally participating in the conferences before those fires actually happened. And um, I just, one of the resources I just want to make sure you're aware of is the ACES community uh, connection in Sonoma County is quite strong and has really done a lot over the past, uh, you know, several years in terms of bringing the information on our on ACES. They brought, um, uh, Rob Anda and who's one of the original uh, investigators in the ACE study and his and Laura Porter um, they have a they do trainings as part of this interface organization which are really designed to bring in this ACE model and sort of spread it the information out and that they were doing that that before the fires happened and I think that group has really played a pretty a, a leadership role of in their community in terms of connecting some of the resources and you know dealing with all of these you know all the things that you raise which are, are so true in terms of adults and kids and triggers and um sorry i'd say one thing and i'm happy to include this in the in the follow-up note is if you haven't um really encourage you to connect with that group um because i know they're doing a lot specifically in the sonoma region to support and build that resilience in those communities after after what happened and I think the fact that I think you've already sort of taken that first step in acknowledging that this is a traumatic event and it's not going to, it's not a one and, and walk away sort of situation. It is going to be ongoing because people have lost homes, because people have experienced um, a loss of income or a loss of, uh, of potentially family. So the acknowledgement and the recognition of it and making sure that families feel validated that this was a really difficult and traumatic event. And then again, um, a step putting into place all those resilient um, factors that we can as far as um, the support systems, the, um, um, you know, what, like Lori said, the, the local, that local um, Sonoma group, ACES group is really strong and probably has some great information that can be used specifically. I'm sure they've developed specifically around um, what the impact that the fires have had and make and I think that um, for the children recognizing their fears like what does this mean are we you know is there a fire around the corner can we not what if we what if we see a campfire or whatever um, you know working with families in strategies on how to address that and to put them at ease that you know not all fire is bad you know those type of things so you can sort of decrease some of their reaction um, you know, take them out of that red zone, scooching them down to yellow, scooching them down into green whenever possible, and for the families as well. I hope that was helpful. I have another hand raised, um, Sitlali. Um, so I'm going to unmute her. Go ahead, Sitlali. Okay, I'm not getting a response. Let me see, there's no more hand raises, but there's more questions on the chat. Okay, she raised her hand again, so um, we cannot hear you. Sitlali? No, we cannot hear. Um, I don't see any more hand raises. I'm going to read another question. Okay, I'm going to read another question then. Um, okay, let me see. Do you ladies know what is the outcome of ACES being used as a tool at the K through 12 schools? What is the outcome? Um, out, I, um, not sure outcome in what way. Um, um, yeah. Um, let me. I, I'm going to unmute you, Rocio, if that's okay with you. I, I'll offer one thing, and I'll and see if this answers the question. I know that some of the schools that are implementing trauma-informed practices are are 
offering sort of sometimes part of what they do and, and bringing in trauma-informed practices at schools, bringing in, you know, mindfulness or sort of justice practices. And part of what some schools are doing is, you know, sharing the information about ACEs, both in terms of like the information we shared today are also asking, um, giving students the opportunity to take the ACE quiz themselves, sort of optional. And with, I think part of the theory of that is when we understand ourselves, it, we understand our lives. And that really, that, that understanding of our own experiences and making sense of it can be a really powerful experience for people. So I don't know if that answers Exactly. I am so. muted. I am muted. Uh, Rocio, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Rocio Laguna. Okay, I don't hear anything. And I just had one other, um, <clears throat> one other suggestion is there's a great movie that's available called Paper Tigers. Yes. And I think you can see it online. You may be able to, um, you, it was also on some of the um, oh, you know, some of those pay-per-view kind of situations, but a lot of times, even iTunes. And um, I would encourage you to watch that. It's really moving, and it's about a high school that implemented trauma-informed practices and the impact it had on the students. Um, most have, who had, who were, this was an alternative high school who had some high-risk kids um, and some really challenging um, behaviors that they entered with and it, just like Lori said the realization of what had happened to them and that it didn't define them and that um built on those successes uh, that that they personally could achieve and they 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 it was very direct they understood their brain um chemistry they understood the development they understood what happened to them and they started to put the pieces together and they had amazing outcomes at the high school level i guess they want to hear the name of the movie um they want you to Repeat the name of the movie. Paper Tigers. Paper Tigers. Okay. And some of the, the most striking, I think, outcomes are specifically around suspension and expulsions. But you also hear that the students themselves talk about the recognition of where they were and where they are now, and and. Um, Sometimes it was a, a straight shot and sometimes, you know, it was two steps forward, one step back, one step back. So really, really, really good, good watching. And, and one thing I'll just throw out, just because we mentioned there are ways, you can find the A survey online, whoever is interested in taking it um, pretty easily. Um, but there's also resilient surveys out there. And I think sometimes pairing them together can be, you know, also additionally powerful. So taking these surveys, understanding our own lives, understanding the lives of the people we're working with, the people we're serving. But the other piece of that puzzle too is the resilience. And those resilience surveys also get at some of these strength-based um, you know, approaches. And, and what else do we have in our lives that can help heal and mitigate some of those, those impacts from the experiences? And the one good thing about, um, when we talked about just validation of, the situ of people's situation, and having them understand that that these things did Im have impacted them in ways that they may not have been familiar. I, I'll share that from personal experience. Um, I adopted both my children from foster care when they were five and six, and they had a lot of those challenging behaviors that many who, who work with young children understand. Um, and I didn't come into this information until unfortunately they were teenagers, but once um, I was exposed to it, of course, my light bulb went off um, recognizing sort of why I was triggered and then I brought it back to them and for them it made so much sense and they, it, it felt so um, empowering to them to recognize that their behaviors weren't because they were bad kids um, but it was because bad things had happened to them and so their brain and their bodies developed around um, what they were exposed to so they were able to sort of step back and not make it such a personal thing and for them, and I know for, I work with a lot of foster youth, that recognition goes a long way. It goes a long way. So that's another way to use this ACEs and resilience combination. You wanna make sure that although they've identified these, these, these um, adverse childhood um, uh, situations, that they also have had these positive interactions and these positive elements in, as well. 
So it's not a lose situation. So Lori and Reagan, I know in the work that we do in strategies throughout the state that uh, trauma-informed care, the ACEs, and resilience has been, you know, the topics that are on everybody's mind. And many communities are joining together to try to develop more resilient communities. And it's, it's just a real honor and a pleasure to be involved with this work throughout the state. I, I love your concept that yes, we go from, you know, what's wrong with you to what happened to you, but even more so to talk about people's survival stories, you know, what's right with you. So it's it's a good work that's going on out there. And I know that one of my favorite quotes is, you know, when I'm having a, a particularly bad day, I like to remember that so far I've survived 100% of what's happened to me. And those are good statistics. So, you know, all of, all of us on this webinar and, and the people we work with, you know, so far they've survived 100% of everything that has happened to them. And so that means that there's something inside of them that is strong and resilient. And that's what we need to, to talk about. So I, I think you gave us a lot of good things to think about. And, um, a lot of people were on today's webinar. So hopefully they'll take this back to their organizations, to their communities, and the conversations will continue. Are, are there any last questions before we close out? So we're good? We're good, Alma? Yeah, I think we're good. There was a lot of questions previously, but they go so fast that it's hard, yes, it's hard. <laughs> to catch up with them, yes. So I, I invite you to go on to our website, www.strategyca.org. You can see what future webinars we have coming up. You can see uh, what trainings we offer at no cost to your organization that we offer throughout the state. Um, Lori and Reagan, hopefully, you know, please do the evaluation that comes up that will come into your computer following this. We really, we look at these. If you want more of them, let us know that. You know, maybe we can bring them back for a part two. So I want to thank everybody for coming on today, and I, I invite you all to have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you so much, Laurie and Reagan. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.